Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Chartered Institute of Public Relations Copywriting Webinar. This webinar is one of the many things that CIPR are doing to support PR professionals during the COVID-19 crisis. We really hope that you'll find it useful. I'm certainly delighted to be with you this afternoon. My name is Margaret Webster. I'm one of the trainers at CIPR. I've been working with them for about three or four years now, and I've been a professional copywriter for over 20 years. Uh, in, in that time, I've written almost every different form of media you can imagine. I've written things as small as tweets and radio ads and uh, things as long as strategy documents, speeches and reports and books. And I really hope that you'll find today's webinar useful. Before we get started, let's have a look at a couple of housekeeping matters. So first of all, this webinar is um, worth five CPT points. So if you are a member of CIPR, do, um, do log on and post your CPT points uh, so that you can get the benefit of them. The webinar will last approximately 45 minutes and we'll have questions at the end. You can ask questions as you think of them as we're going through the webinar. Just put them in the chat chat slash questions box. And my colleague Janet will store them for you. I will answer three questions at the end of the webinar. Webinars are available to all CIPR members indefinitely. And they're available to non-members for the next week. And CIPR webinars are copyrighted to CIPR and the trainer, so they cannot be copied. Um, please bear that in mind. This slide is for anybody who's having trouble with their audio settings. If you can hear me but can't hear me properly, please do open your audio tab, which is in the top right hand corner of your screen, and then click computer audio. So today we're going to be looking at copywriting, and this is a, a quite a long-standing art form or profession. It's been around since the earliest 20th century, and one of the greatest practitioners of the 20th century was a man called David Ogilvy. You can see a picture of him on your screen now. One of his most famous quotes is, you, is this, you cannot bore people into buying your product, you can only interest them in buying it. Now, he was a, a writer who specialized in advertisements. You may not do any advertisements yourself, but the principles he used can easily be applied to other forms of writing, whether that's brochures, blog posts, web posts, press releases, um, articles, even emails. We may not be trying to persuade someone to buy our product in our communication, but we'll be trying to probably be trying to persuade them to do something. So whatever you're trying to achieve with your communications, the best way of doing that is interesting your target audience in your goal. So how exactly do you do that? What's the best way? This is exactly what we're going to be looking at on this webinar. The theme of today's webinar is how to write copy that your target audience will want to read. The first thing you need to do is flag down your target audience with your headline. That's the job of the headline, it's to attract your target audience. It only has to attract your target audience, it doesn't have to work for the whole of humanity. Focus on them, what will interest them, what will attract their attention so you can flag them down. Your second job is to get them to start reading. You have to hook them with your opening paragraph, especially that first paragraph, the first few, first few paragraphs in general. Get them to start reading. That's your next job. And your third job is keep them reading. And the best way of doing that is using a skim readable layout that makes it easy and enjoyable to read. So they're the three things we're gonna be focusing on in today's webinar. The first thing we're gonna look at is headlines. How to flag down your target audience with your headline. Whoops, apologies. So a little brain teaser for you first. Which fictional character did David Ogilvy inspire? You might already know the answer to this. Have a think of the most famous TV, uh, TV advertising show on the whole of television, 
Of course, it was Madman. And its lead character, Don Draper, was in part inspired by David Ogilvy. Now, I need to assure you, it wasn't Don Draper's um, rather colourful personal life that came from David Ogilvy. It's his skill as a copywriter. In fact, the series writer, um, he actually studied David Ogilvy's book, Confessions of an Advertising Man, to get some inspiration for his show for Mad Men. And I think that it's well worth our time to study this book as well, because it is has many, many pearls of wisdom about copywriting, and we're going to be drawing on it in today's webinar. This is another of David Ogilvy's most famous quotes. The headline is the most important element in most advertisement. It is the telegram which decides the reader whether to read the copy. Now, that language is quite old fashioned for us now. But the meaning, the, the message is still really relevant to us. What he's trying to say is the headline is the thing that readers use to decide whether they're going to read the rest of the communication. It's the first make or break point. So we really have to make sure headlines work for our target audience. Luckily, David Ogilvy was kind enough to write down his 10 rules for headlines in the book that I've just mentioned to you confessions of an advertising man and here they are number one flag down your readers who are your prospects so who are you trying to appeal to identify those people think about what is going to work and not work for them so you can flag them down number two appeal to the reader's self-interest what's in it for them how can you make this headline this advertisement this communication this press release relevant to those people Put that in your headline. Number three, always try to inject news into your headlines. David Ogilvy said the two most useful words you can have in an advertisement are free and new. You can't always use free, in fact, seldom use free, but you can often use new. So if you have something new to say, then put that in your headline. People pay attention to things that are new. Number four, use power words and emotional words. So power words and emotional words, they are words that get a big response from our readers. I'm going to read you David Ogilvy's own list from his book. Let's have a look at it. So he says, um, power words, free and new, as we've already mentioned. How to, suddenly, now, announcing, introducing, it's here, just arrived, important development, improvement, amazing, sensational, remarkable, revolutionary, startling, miracle, magic, offer, quick, easy, wanted, challenge, advice to, the truth about, compare, bargain, hurry, and last chance. And emotional words, which really connect with people's heart, are words like darling, love, fear, proud, friend, and baby. So if you can use those words in your headline, people will have a response to them. Number five, tell the readers what brand you're advertising. Now, if you don't write advertisements, this rule is still relevant to you. Tell the readers what topic you're talking about. What is the matter in hand? Make sure that's clear in the headline so they don't have to guess. Number six, include your selling promise. That needs a long headline. David Ogilvy's most famous headline had 18 words and it shifted a whole lot of product. So it was very, very effective. Often people think that readers will only read very short headlines, but that's just not true. If you need extra words to get your meaning across, then use them. Number seven, arouse people's curiosity so they'll want to read on. We need to get them moving from the headline to the first paragraph. And one of the best way to do that is make people curious as to what's going to come next. So these are David Ogilvy's seven do's. These are the things that we sh he thinks that we should do with our headlines. He also has three don'ts. Number eight, don't write tricksy headlines with puns. People shouldn't have to guess what your communication is about. If they do have to guess, they probably won't bother. So make sure that that meaning is clear. Don't obscure it with a pun. Number nine, don't use negatives. 
people will pay most attention to the keywords in your headline. And if your keywords paint a negative picture, that is the picture they're likely to have. For example, if you had our salt doesn't contain chloride, what you've done is link your salt and chloride, and that's created a negative picture in your reader's mind's eye. So to avoid negatives, focus on the positives. And finally, number 10, don't use blind headlines that rely on the body copy. So a blind headline doesn't really tell you what the headline is about, or even worse, no headline at all. That's hopeless. The place that you see the most blind headlines is email, which is really crazy given how many emails most people have to process in a day. If you want to make your email stand out, just simply telling people what the what the subject of the email is in the headline, in the subject line, will make the people more likely to read them. So these rules can be applied to almost every medium that we use today. Let's have a look now at how David Ogilvy himself applied these rules in practice. This is the famous headline with 18 words. It's a Rolls Royce. At 60 miles an hour, the loud, loudest noise in the new Rolls Royce comes from the electric clock. So he paints a very refined and elegant picture of the Rolls Royce. This advertisement ran from about 1958 to 1962 in the USA, and it was one of the things that really helped Rolls-Royce increase its sales in America. Now, David Ogilvy had a minuscule media budget um, for Rolls-Royce. So I want you to take a guess as to where you think he might have um, put his advertisements. What we're gonna do now is have a look at our first poll. So let me just launch that for you. So what I'd like you to do is take a guess. Where do you think David Adv Ogilvy advertised the Rolls Royce? Just give you a few more minutes. I can see quite a few people coming in. That's fantastic. Just give you a few more seconds. Okay, let's share those uh, share those results. So um, many of you voted for the Wall Street Journal, and I can see why you voted for it. It seems like the obvious place to um, pitch the Rolls Royce. He actually advertised in the New Yorker magazine. New Yorker magazine and the New York Times. So well done if you picked that. I think what he was trying to do was associate this with um, culture and refinement. And that's the kind of things that would appeal to the upper class readers of the New Yorker magazine. Let's have a look at the next ad. It's for Dove Soap. Darling, I'm having the most extraordinary experience. I'm head over heels in Dove. Now, it seems at first that David Ogilvy has broken one of his own rules because he has used a pun, but it's much more clever and subtle than it first appears. He's substituted the name of the product for the word love in the well-known phrase, I'm head over heels in love. And what it does is associate dove and love. And it gives us a little dopamine hit as, as we have cleverly made that, um, that switch, our, that association itself. And it... Um, it starts off with one of our emotional words, darling. Now, interestingly, David Ogilvy got a psychologist to test people's reactions to hundreds of words, and the one that had the biggest reaction was darling, and that's why he used this in this ad. Now, these ads were the beginning of Dove's dominance as the world's biggest soap brand, and it, uh, it was hugely successful. I want you to have a guess as to who you think this ad is designed to appeal to. So um, let's have a look at this one. Was this ad designed to appeal to men or women? Votes are coming in, very good.
Okay, so let's close that poll now and share it. So well done. Yes, it is women. Um, the ad is definitely designed to appeal to women. I think that was quite clever. Women were much more likely to buy this type of product um, when this ad ran in the 60s. And um, also, they it's designed to show that they using Dove can make you more attractive. You know, famously, it uh, sells itself on having moisturizing cream and making your skin softer. Women tend to be more interested or more pressured into valuing their appearance than men. So this ad was very much designed to appeal to women. Okay, a very different type of ad now. Um, this one is for Puerto Rico. Now, Puerto Rico offers 100% tax exemption to new industry. Let's have a look at this ad. It was hugely successful. 14,000 people cut out the coupon that was in the newspaper with this ad. And many, many people set up factories in Puerto Rico. It made a real difference to this country. Um, why was it so successful? Let's see if you can have a guess. What do you think are the most powerful and persuasive words in this ad? So I'll just give you a few minutes for the poll results to come in. Okay. So absolutely, you're you're one hundred percent right. One hundred percent tax exemption. If there was ever an emotional power phrase in the world, it's one hundred percent tax exemption. So people tend to feel really quite emotional about tax. But the people who said now and new industry, you're absolutely right as well, because now conveys immediacy. People want to know what's happening at the moment and new flags down our attention as well. And industry shows who the readers are that we're talking about, not tourists, not uh, travelers, not backpackers, um, but industry people. So they are also very, very powerful. And Puerto Rico, absolutely, that is the subject. That's what we're talking about. So every single word in this headline is working very, very hard. Okay, ad number four, this time it's for Schweppes. It's mutiny to mix a gin and tonic without Schweppes. So David Ogilvy was the advertising person who launched Schweppes in America. I want you to think about um, who the target audience is for this ad. Who is he trying to appeal to? Let's have a look. So as you can see, the ad came with a picture of some uh, rather glamorous people on a pleasure yacht. Who are they trying to appeal to? So we're just getting the responses in now, very good. Just give you a couple more seconds. Okay. So a real mix, um, a real mix of results there. Um, the, oh, oh, sorry, I see the share's gone away. Let's put that up again. Um, a real mix of results there, but we've just come in with the winner, people who like gin and tonic, and that absolutely is the target audience. He flags them out in the, in the headline, gin and tonic. I guess that at the time, almost all tonic in America was drunk in a gin and tonic. So if you can win over that audience, it probably doesn't matter too much about the rest of them. So well done. And one more ad for you. How to tour the USA for 35 pounds a week. Now this seems like the dullest of dull headlines. But it was so successful that travel agents in Britain, France and Germany had to work through the night to handle all the inquiries. And um, the number of tourists from those countries that visited the USA after these advertisements in the, ran about for the next eight months went up by um, tw about 20 percent in each of those countries. It was hugely effective. Um, so again, I just want you to think about the target audience. Why was it so effective? Who is he? trying to appeal to. Let's have our, our final poll for David Ogilvy's ads. So who is he trying to appeal to? OK, 
Okay, we're just bringing in those um, votes now. Thank you so much. Just give you a few more seconds. Okay, so let's share those now. Well done, everybody. You're absolutely right. It's people who want to visit the USA, but they think they can't afford it. So how did he, why did he decide on this? Well, quite simply because he did some research and he found out the biggest barrier to visiting the USA was people thought it was going to cost a lot more than it really did. So he designed the entire ad around this. And please note that he didn't use a bland headline like, how to use how to tour the USA for less than you think, or visiting in America is more affordable. Um, what he, uh, I'll just share that for you. What he said is how to tour the USA for 35 pounds a week. He made it really specific, and this helped people decide whether they could afford it or not. And interestingly, he came up with that figure after um, sending out one of his assistants to work out how much it would cost to visit America. Okay, so these are David Ogilvie's rules, his 10 rules, and we can adapt them to work for whatever media that we, we use. They're very, very helpful and they help us to really flag down our target audience. Let's look now um, at what we, need, what we need to do to hook our target audience. And that is the job of the opening paragraph. What I'd like to do with you now is just share 10 ideas to stimulate your creativity. Um, once you've hooked your, once you've flagged down your target audience, how do you get them to start reading? Number one, you can be witty or humorous. Now this can be a high risk strategy, but if you can come up with wit or humor that works for your target audience, it's a really great way of getting people to start reading. Number two, open with a quote tried and tested technique. I'm sure we've all used it. Um, we love quotes. We like to know what people think and feel. Number three, establish a sense of place or time. This can be quite intriguing, especially if it's somewhat unexpected or if the audience doesn't know that. There's been some great articles over the last couple of months describing the deserted streets of, mod of major cities. And it's given us a real feel for those places when we can't visit them ourselves. Number four, put a single person in the spotlight. We are interested in individuals. We find them easier to think about than a whole mass of people. So if you've got one person you can focus on, they can really draw your reader into their story. Number five, state the problem in a nutshell. What's going on here? Why does this matter? What's the challenge that's facing us or our readers or, or that we all need to think about? Number six, state the goal in a nutshell. If you don't wanna focus on the problem, maybe focus on the solution. How can you excite people about where you want, where they could get to? How can you get them to picture that? Maybe start with that. Number seven, focus on what's new or different. We've already discussed, people pay attention to things that are new or novel. So if you have something new, then do highlight that and do it early on, maybe in your opening paragraph. Number eight, empathize with your audience's struggle. As, is this an audience of people who have problems that others don't understand? Can you show that you do understand them? You feel their pain and you're here to help them. Is that a good way of drawing in them in? Number nine, ask them a question. This can work really well, but do make sure it's a question that they're likely to say yes to, or a question, an open question that just gets them thinking. Try to avoid questions where people might say no or where your target audience might say no. Number 10, promise your reader a benefit. So this really builds on the work of the headline. Uh, what's in it for your reader? What are you promising them that if they read your communication that they're going to get? Again, you could highlight this in your first paragraph. Okay, I've got another little poll for you. This time I'm interested to find out what you do in your own writing. So um, do share with us which one of these techniques do you think works really well for you? Um, unfortunately, I couldn't put 10 on a poll. I can only have five. I have combined problem and goal into one. 
but let's have let's find out what you like using in your opening paragraphs your hooks okay so i'll just give you a few seconds to vote for that okay quite a mix very interesting all of them are popular one of them is particularly particularly popular i'll just give you a couple more seconds all right and then i'll share that for you so um what we've got here is uh people love to state the problem or the goal in the nutshell really focus on what we're talking about but asking questions promising benefits using humor and focusing on a single person also work really well for everybody so um i would just encourage you to mix it up a little bit try different techniques as well as the ones that are that already work well for you okay we're now on to the last part of our copywriting seminar how to keep people reading by using a skim readable layout this is really really important there's no point flagging down your target audience with your fantastic headline and then intriguing them with your opening paragraph your hook if you just bore them by using a terrible layout so let's look at how we do that whoops so as you can see we can have a layout that's so awful that people just don't even want to read at all if you look at this it feels boring it feels hard work you can't figure out what it's about you have no incentive to read that your mind is just thinking boring 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 i want to do something else so we want to avoid writing that is off-putting that looks like a gray wall of text instead we want to create a, a layout that shows people what we're talking about and also makes it easy for them to get started reading and to keep reading and 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 see our main points really really easily we want to use a layout that's inviting that draws people in like this lovely garden path draws people through the garden so the way to um the way to uh the way to uh, apologies the way to get read is to have a skim readable layout that's the key thing that makes all the difference and what does that look like well readers are hunting in an f-shaped pattern what they're looking for is keywords and these are the information rich words which communicate most of our message and it's absolutely important that people find these keywords because the reason people skim read is in order to decide if something's worth the time and effort to read. If something doesn't pass the skim reading test, it won't get read at all. Simple as that. So where are people looking? Well, the first place they look is in the headline. Um, and we already know the head job of the headline is to flag down our target audience. So the headline must work. It's the first place people look. Second place is the opening the first two paragraphs especially the first paragraph and that's why the hooks the opening paragraph matter so much if people aren't intrigued at this stage they don't read on they look in the top lines of paragraphs so it's really important the way you structure your paragraph you need to have your key point at the top of the paragraph and in the top line the top line matters a lot more than the first sentence so if you structure your top line background information comma key point your key point will be split over the end of the first line and the beginning of the second line and that's not where people look if you structure your opening sentence with a key point because background information your key point is at the top on the top line and that's exactly where people look so really pay attention to the structure of that first sentence in every paragraph People also look down the left-hand side, that's where they skim. So we want as many of our keywords on the left-hand side. And they look at the subheadings. Copywriters describe subheadings as magic because they can draw people in. They can work like bullet points for the whole document, just really calling out the key points in your whole communication. They're absolutely essential. We also want to have make sure our paragraph and sentence lengths work for our readers. So let's just look quickly at how we can do that. Quite simply, it's all about length. 
Your first paragraph should be really short. I recommend less than two whole lines, about 1.7 lines maximum. The reason for that is that means the entire first paragraph is skim readable because um, we tend to pay attention most to the first and last lines in a paragraph. So if we only have a first and last line, the whole paragraph can be read at skim reading. Paragraphs two and onwards can be a bit longer, between two and 4.7 lines long. That really depends on the medium. The rule of thumb is, does it look good on the page? Does it look appealing? Would I want to read it if I was the reader? Um, whatever medium you're using, I strongly recommend you don't go up past five whole lines long. That's where readability just drops off a cliff. For your sentence length, the absolute maximum length of any sentence is 25 words. .gov.uk won't let you upload a sentence with more than 25 words. And that's because readability, understandability just really diminishes past 25 words. Your average sentence length ideally should be about 17 words. Um, there's a tool on Microsoft Word called Microsoft Readability Tool that will calculate you calculate that for you automatically. So do just Google Microsoft Readability Tool and you'll be able to find out all the details. If you have an audience which has a low attention span or um, you think they might have a low educational level, then make that maximum sentence length and that average sentence length small, shorter and that will help it work better for your audience. So that's how we can make our layout work well for our audience to keep them reading. Okay, one final poll for you. Do you shape your writing so it's skim readable? I'm really interested to find out what you do. So what, what have you done in the past? What do you currently do? Um, do you already design your write, reading so it's skim readable? Um, do you sometimes do it? Are you going to start doing it? Just give you a few more seconds for those responses. Nearly there. Okay, lovely. So I'm really delighted to see that a quarter of you are already designing writing to be as skim readable as possible. That's fantastic. And nearly 40% of you are doing that most of the time. For the third of you who aren't doing it yet, um, I'm really pleased that you are going to be doing it from now on. That's fantastic, really great news. Okay, so that is the end of the content, um, but stay with us because um, I would just like to just quickly summarize what we've done and then, um, and then we're gonna do some action planning and questions. So to summarize, first of all, how can you write copy that your target audience will want to read? Number one, Flag down your target audience with your headline. Number two, get them to start reading by hooking them with your opening paragraph. And number three, keep them reading by using a skim readable layout. All of these things matter hugely because the brutal truth for us as writers is if people don't read what we write, we cannot get our message across. But if we design our copy so that it works for our target audience as well as for us, then they will read it and we will be able to get our message across. Okay, a little bit of action planning. So what I'd like you to do is just quickly grab a piece of paper and a pen and write down at least one thing that you are going to do differently when you write copy after this, uh, after this webinar. Um, and what we'll do now is just have a look at questions. So I'll just um, bring those over. Um, so, I need to, apologies, I'm just struggling to make my questions big enough for me to read. Um, one second. Okay, nearly there. Um, okay, which book am I reading from? So I can answer that question very easily. So it's Confessions from an Advertising Man by David Ogilvy. So as I mentioned, this is was one of the inspiration pieces for um, the creator of Mad Men, but it's really useful for us as copywriters as well. A lot of the principles, especially the, the 10 rules for headlines come straight out of this book. Really, really recommend it. Um, question number, so that was from Sunina, thank you for that. So Ray has asked, how many of these ideas to stimulate creativity should we use? 
That, that's a really interesting question, Ray. I would probably go for one in any any particular opening paragraph, um, any hook, but you could possibly use two. Like for example, if there was a famous person who had a quote, which was a question, that might be a way of combining a question and a quote. Um, I would make sure you do one thing really well rather than trying to use two, three, four. If it works, then um, if it works, then then use it. Experiment, try it out. It is worth investing time in your headline, your opening paragraph, and your subheadings. That's where the investment of time really pays off. Um, number th the third one from Tony. Do you think some of the rules on sentence lengths are there to be broken? Tony, uh, to be honest, I don't. <laughs> I don't. I uh, I have I often review other people's work. So I, I edit and other people's work sometimes and I coach people and I find that long sentences always, almost always, almost without exception, make things worse. And there's very few occasions where you can't take a long sentence and break it into two or three and make it better. So I would, I would stick with it. Yeah, I really would. Um, and that's what I encourage people to do. Um, thank you very much for your questions. And um, what I'd like you to do as a final thing is just share some of your actions. So could you please share your actions using chat, uh, the chat questions box? And um, I'd be really interested to hear what you're going to do differently after this, after this webinar. So please share them now, please send them in. Okay, so we've got shortened sentences, avoid puns, um, use the F layout, fantastic. Um, well, another another one who's going to give up puns, more skim readable layout, fantastic. Work more on their hooks, structuring paragraphs, yes. That will make a big difference. Your most important point in the top line. Hook in the first sentence. Key point, then the details, fantastic. Uh, sentence lengths, more subheadings. These are great things, fantastic. I'm really, really delighted to hear that you're going to be using this in your work. I, I really am absolutely thrilled. There's loads and loads coming in. I, I just can't read them all out. Um, thank you so much for your time today. It has been an absolute pleasure working with you. I do hope you find this helpful. One final thing, or two, a couple of final things. Number one, you can get the handouts on your, on the bar on the right hand side, the very last one is there's some handouts. Um, so there's a handout which has all of the key learnings from this webinar. So please do download that before you log off. Um, then number two, a couple of bits of key information, just to remind you, this webinar is worth it, five CPD points. Um, the webinar is available indefinitely for CIPR members and to non-members for a week. And please do bear in mind that this is copyrighted to CIPR, so cannot be copied. Please do um, download the handouts because they will be, um, they, they have got all the key learnings from this. This we webinar is gonna be published on, um, sorry, just notice Belinda has asked if there are two handouts, there's only one, there's only one handout. Um, the, the webinar and the handout is gonna be published on the CIPR website and you will be able to access everything there. Thank you again for your time today. That's been really fantastic. Bye-bye.